can we believe in the magic of Christmas just a little bit more? That's what we're going to talk about today. Oh, Christmas isn't just a day. It's a frame of mind. And that's what's been changing. That's why I'm glad I'm here. Maybe I can do something about it. Chris Kringle, Miracle on 34th Street. Now, I'm not a big Santa person. I've never, even as a kid, been into Santa. I didn't think the physics worked out correctly. But this podcast, we're going to talk about the movie from 1947, The Miracle on 34th Street. It was one of my favorites. In the other podcast, Small Steps with God, I talk about a Charlie Brown Christmas, which was also another one of my favorites. For a person who didn't believe in God or didn't believe in Santa, I sure have a lot of Christmas movies on my list. The movie starts out with the store Macy's, which is a real store, looking for a brand new Santa. Apparently, their other Santa was quite drunk, and so they needed a new one. And in comes this man, looks the part, looks amazingly like Santa. Also, it's British. I don't know if Santa's British, but in their quest to have this new Santa work at the store, it tells the story of belief, mistrust, and how we can give each other hope in the Christmas season. And the person they hired to be Santa Claus thinks his name is actually Chris Kringle, which makes everyone look at each other kind of funny. You know what? He looks the part, and they're desperate. To have that really good Santa so that all the kids lining up to sit on Santa's lap and tell him what they want and could be there for the kids. And they really need a good Santa who looks the part, is not drunk, and can be the Santa for all the kids lining up so they can tell Santa what they want for Christmas. But the other part of this movie, too, is about teaching a store how to be a good store and how to help their customers. And there's a lot of messages in this show. The show focuses around a young girl named Susan Walker, and she doesn't believe in Santa Claus or anything. But that's because her mom told her that she shouldn't believe in anything. Her mom is Doris Walker, and she's very practical and doesn't believe in anything. You can also tell that it has a lot to do with some past heartbreaks that she's had in her life, and she doesn't want to believe in anything anymore. Life is just straightforward. And she taught her daughter the same message. I think it's because she was trying to protect her daughter. She didn't want her daughter believing in something fake and then just having heartbreak like she has. So she teaches her daughter, only the things you see in front of you matter. Then comes to Santa Claus. So he starts seeing kids, having them sit on the lap, and he starts making promises for them to get gifts. The interesting thing is, though, when one of the parents confronts him and says, how dare you tell my child? we can get this fire truck. Macy doesn't even have any in stock anymore. And Santa does the unimaginable thing. He tells the mother, you can go to this other store. Not only is it in stock, but the price is much better. At first, Macy's store manager was angry. How dare you tell people to go to other stores? But then when he sees the woman come back to Santa Claus and say, that's incredible that you would tell me to go somewhere else. From now on, I'm always going to shop at Macy's. And he realized this is what makes for loyal customers, helping them, whether it helps Macy's or not. And having a loyal customer that'll buy everything else is more important than whether a customer will buy a fire truck at that store. And there's a lawyer in there that I think Doris Walker really likes. And he's just a sweet guy. And he wants to help this Chris Kringle because he thinks that Chris Kringle is just nice. He's cute. And it just brings a charming message of Christmas. I don't think that he believes that this is Chris Pringle for real, but why not just let the old man talk to kids, charm kids, and let them have a great experience? And while Macy's itself also doesn't believe in Chris Kringle, they want to be careful. I mean, this is a guy who's clearly lost it. He thinks he's Chris Kringle. Should we allow him around kids? But they do, and he does such a wonderful job. But there is a character in this show, which is a psychologist that works for Macy's, who thinks that this Chris Kringle is delusional, is someone who believes that he is Chris Kringle and he should be committed, not being brought in front of children. And at one point, they give him a psychological test, even though Chris says he's been through many of them. 
And when Kris Kringle gets mad at him, kind of bonks him a little bit with his cane. And the psychologist pretends that he got flattened out by Santa so that they would be able to arrest him and send him to the mental institution for examination and then commitment. And so the plot starts to thicken about what do we do about Kris Kringle. So then comes the important issue of the court case. Now, Chris is going to be committed against his will. But Mr. Galley, he's the guy who's going to save Chris Kringle. Remember, that's the lawyer that Doris Walker kind of likes, kind of thinks is sweet. And they start going out through the course of this movie. And he decides he's going to represent Chris Kringle in court, even at the expense of his own job, his own reputation, and even maybe what Doris Walker thinks of him. The question is, is how do you save a man when you have a city like New York or any place that doesn't believe that Kris Kringle is real. So then comes the court hearing, and everyone's in court. Children and older people and younger people, everyone wants to see what the fate of Santa Claus is going to be. They testify. They have the psychologist testify. They even talk about what a political issue this would be, that by trying Kris Kringle, this could lead your re-election in peril because who puts Santa Claus in jail? So while he's being held, Susan, the little girl, writes Kris Kringle a letter to cheer him up. And Doris also signs it and sends it. When the New York Post Office then sees Susan's letter addressed to Kris in New York at the courthouse, they decide, you know what, we should take all these letters that are addressed to Santa Claus, as well as this one to Kris Kringle, free up all the storage, and deliver them to the courthouse, and that way they can get rid of them. So while the court comes back into session, the post office walks in and delivers some of the letters. The judge wants to see them all. So then they start dumping bag after bag, filling up the desk of the judge until you can't even see the judge anymore. And the point being that if the post office, a federal office, recognizes Chris Kringle As Santa Claus in this particular case, he has to be Santa Claus. I mean, I bet you after this movie, there were rules put in place at the post office to never deliver Santa letters to anyone real. And the case gets dismissed. Chris Kringle is free. What a treat that is. Then the next day on Christmas morning, Macy's has an employee party. Who throws a party on Christmas morning? But Susan loses her faith in Chris Kringle because she asked him, for a house that they could live in all together as a family. At this point, Doris is lighthearted. So that just because something doesn't happen doesn't mean you keep, doesn't mean you don't keep trying and that you should have an imagination and a believe in things that are not seeable, not just the practical things. And then while they're driving away with Doris and Mr. Galley, Susan sees the house she asked for. And not only that, there's a sign out front that it's for sale. She stops the car, she gets out of the car, and she runs into the house. It's exactly what she asked for. Everything is exactly what she wanted. The bedroom is what she asked for. The swing in the backyard is what she asked for. Fred Galley learns that Doris encouraged Susan to believe in Santa, believe in Chris, and give it more tries which Susan did do. She closed her eyes and wished again. They hint at the fact that they're going to get married and buy the house, and they're going to live there as a family. And then when they look in the corner of the house, there's Chris's cane, and they all go, what? It must be an amazing situation to see that this was a house Chris Kringle picked out for a family he didn't practically know was going to happen. This is a story written by Valentine Davies, who wrote the screenplay. It was filmed in New York, which is amazing to watch because when you see the parade for Christmas, it's the real New York parade as it was in 1947. There's no caged metal things that people have to stand in. The balloons are archaic, but really awesome. And it shows you too, that festive feeling of New York. It's a little bit more regulated now. Of course, you have to have more police now. So just seeing it in the Thanksgiving Day Parade, as New York was in 1947, is neat to see, too. It's also fun to see what an old department store with Christmas displays, everything else set up 
so that it's ready to go for Christmas. It's just a very old-fashioned type of Christmas that just warms the heart and encourages everyone to have more imagination, be generous, be nice to each other, and also wish for the things that they want. It's about the spirit of Christmas and the spirit of Santa Claus being in our hearts and believing that we can be more, that Christmas can be more, but instead of just the bare minimum and gifts and the commercialism of Santa. The interesting thing is, Susan, is Natalie Wood. The mother is Maureen O'Hara, who is an amazing actress, and I love her in everything that she's ever been in. So not only does this movie give you this great spirit, this great message of hope and kindness, it also brings out these wonderful actresses, and tells us that we don't have to believe in fairy tales, but we can have hope that our dreams come true, that there is something more to life than just what meets the eye. And even in the very end, Susan's mother, Doris, believes it too. So my challenge to you is because you think of a way to give yourself hope and kindness and compassion for other people, to yourself and to the people around you, this Christmas? Is there a way that you can just believe in the spirit of Christmas? All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please have a very happy holidays and Merry Christmas. I hope it's wonderful for you. And I hope you can find that spirit, that thing that you can't see, but you know is there this Christmas season. And remember, our step through the year ending towards the Christmas holiday starts with small steps.